Hi, in chapter seven, we're talking about the development of and the dissolution of medieval civilization. In this timeline, I'd like to point out something to you. About in the middle, from 1347 to 1351, you see that the Black Death reaches Italian ports and ravages Europe. Just want to point out, you know, we hear a lot of comparisons between the Black Death or the bubonic plague with the coronavirus. So just want to point out here that during this time in civilization, 1347 to 1351, when medical advancements were close to nothing, that this pandemic was a four-year pandemic. So if you are looking for a little hope these days for uh, an earlier end to coronavirus, keep in mind, we have medicine on our side now. So we have some hope there. Just wanted to point that out to you. The 12th century awakening encouraged the return of stability and uh, was encouraged by the revival of trade and travel. As people travel, as people practiced commerce and went from port to port, they began to pick up other elements of culture again, and people kind of started being interested in developing among other cultures and interacting among other cultures. There was also a renewed acquaintance with Greek and Roman learning through contact with Islamic Spain and Byzantium. The uh, evolution of universities came about at this time too, and university curricula at this point relied on Latin translations of ancient texts, especially the works of Aristotle. And universities performed a crucial function during the Middle Ages because students learned the ideas of reasoned argument. This image shows God as the architect of the universe. And that's really kind of how the medieval people saw religion. God is the architect. God is the builder of everything. And as the builder of everything, he was the top link in something known as the great chain of being, which extended all the way from God, who would have been the upper link, down to the lowest form of existence. So in terms of religion at this time, the medieval people saw the universe split into two worlds, the higher worlds and the lower worlds, the upper and the lower. The cosmos was this ladder with God at the top and Satan at the bottom, now, not a physical ladder, but they envisioned it as such. God was at the top, Satan was at the bottom. And the thing about ladders is that they allow for mobility. You can climb up a ladder, you can also climb down a ladder. You can climb up a ladder and you can fall down a ladder too. So this idea of the ladder with God at the top and Satan at the bottom depicts the way that people see life in general. They can strive to be better. They can make decisions intentionally that take them back down a little bit. Or they can strive to be better and unintentionally fall down somewhat. The thing is, you can always get back on the ladder and climb again. So they see the individual as sinful but redeemable. That ability to move back upward shows redeem redeemability. God's gift of free will enabled man to disobey, which allowed him to climb down the ladder a little bit. But they could overcome their sinful nature and climb back up again. Everything in the universe at this particular time period was organized according to a hierarchy, this great chain of being. And it ranged from God at the very top to the soulless objects like sand or rocks. So sand and rocks would be lower because they don't live. Grass would be a little higher than that because it had life to it. And then all the way up to humans and then on up to God. The medieval people really gained a sense of security from this kind of medieval worldview because it gave them a, a definition of where they were, what they were over, and where they could go, what they could strive to be. This is um, an example 
uh, a piece of art that represents the School of Bologna, um, which is spelled like Bologna. Okay, don't say School of Bologna. But um, the School of Bologna was a university setting that focused on curriculum known as the Trivium and the Quadrivium. The Trivium included grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic. So grammar, you know, using words, rhetoric, using words to persuade, and dialectic, using words to communicate. So it's all about words in the Trivium. The um, Quadrivium focused on numbers. Mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and music. And you may be thinking, what, you know, how is music a number? Well, if you play music, you know that there are whole notes, quarter notes, half notes, the, the rhythm that you count in order to play. So very much numerical in that regard. The technique of teaching during this time period was disputatio, which is basically oral argument between a master and a student. So instead of going to class and listening to a lecture, you might go to class and your instructor would ask you a question and you would give a thoughtful answer and then they would provide a, but what if this, which would lead you to another answer. And then, but what if that, then a, yet another answer still, very much focused on critical thinking. The best minds studied philosophy, which was known as the queen of the sciences. You might remember in the last chapter, I mentioned Boethius, who wrote The Consolation of Philosophy. And in that story, it was about how during his exile, um, an apparition known as Lady Philosophy came to offer him comfort during his exile. And she was known as Lady Philosophy. So uh, that's why she was called Lady, because philosophy was seen as the queen of sciences. The scholastic masters used reason to serve faith. The people of this time period insisted that the study of nature did not obstruct the pursuit of grace. So throughout development, uh, you know, we've seen through history where people were saying uh, science can't go with religion, religion can't go with science, but these people are reconciling it. They're using philosophy to reconcile science and religion and actually using philosophy to try to help the contemplation of God. They said that truths could not be deduced by reason alone and that some truths had to be accepted on faith. Um, some more conservative theologians opposed the use of reason to understand Christian teaching, saying that faith alone should be enough. Saint Anselm of Canterbury used reason to prove the ills of faith. And Abelard suggested that inconsistencies were reconcilable through reason. St. Thomas Aquinas, the synthesis of faith and reason, um, wrote that since reason and faith both come from God, they cannot be in conflict. Um, this would be a good time for you to watch both videos, the video about St. Anselm and the one about Thomas Aquinas. So if you're... Um, Reviewing these notes on your own, great time to switch over to those videos. St. Thomas Aquinas is, um, you may read something from him later called Summa Theologica, which was this uh, systematic exposition of Christian thought. And it really exemplified the medieval attempt to integrate Aristotle with Christianity. So philosophy with Christianity. The scientific movement occurred in the 13th and 14th centuries. It was influenced by Islamic Byzantine and the ancient Greek civilizations. The study of nature and mathematics came to be viewed as valid fields of study and a means to understand and master nature. Also, we start to see during this time period a recovery of Roman law. Remember when the Germans came in and took over the Roman Empire as barbarians, they did not pursue or try to try to learn or keep any part of the Roman Empire in terms of law. Um, Roman law was based on belief in rational universal, universal principles and um, the barbaric law was not like that. So we start to see people returning an interest to those ancient Roman laws. 
And this is an example of a troubadour. You see the gentleman there playing a flute or clarinet. That would probably be a clarinet. Anyway, he's uh, serenading this woman and uh, singing love poems to her. And uh, this is a time period when women were worshipped. Um, kind of the chivalry, you know, chivalric society was uh, in play here at this time. And women were the muse of much poetry. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a few minutes. It kind of extends the courtly love that we talked about in the last chapter. We have some new literary and poetical forms that are developed during this time period in both Latin and the vernacular languages. Remember, vernacular language simply refers to the language of the people, the common spoken language. Latin would have been the um, edited language that people would have uh, read and written in for academia, but vernacular language is the common man's language. The Shanchons digest for epic poems about heroism. The Roman with the lowercase r combined legends, chivalry, and Christianity. And troubadour songs, which is what the last slide uh, showed an example of, involved the romantic glorification of women. And the Nibelungen lead were German heroic epics. Dante's Divine Comedy summarized medieval perspective and an understanding of life's meaning. Dante's Divine Comedy did a lot more than that. Now, we haven't gotten to the Protestant Reformation yet. It's coming up in the 1500s, so we will get to it before the end of the semester. But uh, the Protestant Reformation um, in the 1500s is when Martin Luther calls into question some of the practices of the Catholic Church. Dante does that in 1321 with his finished product, The Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy is this three-part series or this three-part story uh, that starts with the Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradise. So he's going through hell, he's going through Purgatory, and then he's getting to heaven in order to find his dear Beatrice, who is his muse, which really reflects this courtly love kind of situation. Now, as far as Dante went, um, he was married. He had an arranged marriage with a um, daughter of a wealthy person from Italy. But Beatrice, who he met when he was nine years old, was forever his muse. And so in this divine comedy, which, by the way, is not the kind of comedy that we think of today. It's kind of a comedy as in satire of um, the situation. But um, Dante uses this allegorical poem in order to call out the Catholic Church for things that he sees as a misuse of power in the church. And this would be a great time to switch over and watch that video clip about the Divine Comedy. And we have these columns here that are on pedestals that are realistic in a way. And uh, they also have classical traits too. But they, dis they display these very warm-like features that are less than perfect. They're very human-like here. They're Mary and Elizabeth, the expectant mothers of Jesus and John the Baptist. So very much holy figures in regards to the church, but very humanistic as well. In terms of architecture, we see two enduring styles during this time period, the Romanesque and Gothic. Romanesque architecture was um, demonstrated with massive walls and rounded arches, with small windows that restricted light. The Gothic style had pointed arches that created this kind of lofty structure, these tall pointed arches would narrow at the top and point straight up to get as close to heaven as possible. They had very high ceilings and large windows that uh, let so much light in, and it resulted in, like I said, this illusion of trying to reach upward into heavens. And this is the Notre Dame Cathedral in France before it burned, obviously. Um, these two spires or steeples 
that are facing the western part of the towers show two very different types of architecture, although they're both goth they're both Gothic. The simple spire at the north was built between 1160 and 1170, but the south spire is the one that's more elaborate and a little bit taller. It was constructed in the early 16th century and is an example of that more Gothic flamboyant type of architecture style. Again, they're both Gothic, but um, the simple one is older. In terms of the 14th century, um, we also see some adversity. This is where we start to see the fall of the medieval times, um, the dissolution of the Middle Ages. Agricultural expansion had exhausted the topsoil. Throughout history, throughout this course, we have seen um, civilization go from a two crop system to a three crop system, but the expansion of agriculture at this point has exhausted the topsoil, which just means uh, things are hard to grow. It leads to famine and economic crisis. And again, I mentioned at the beginning of this, the bubonic plague from um, 1347 to 1351. I want to mention too here that something that's kind of interesting is that we see in children sometimes this rare condition that's associated with coronavirus in children is showing these kids that have these strange rashes develop that have these big swellings, these big welts, you know, on their skin. And bubonic plague was very similar. I mean, that's what bubonic stands for, bubos, are large swellings of the skin. So I thought that was kind of interesting to, to make that connection with something that we're associating with our current pandemic. But as you might imagine, people have spent so much time throughout these Middle Ages associating science and religion and finding ways to make it jive, to make it um, connect with each other, that when things start turning bad with famine, with the plague, um, people are starting to turn away from the church. Their confidence in the church begins to decline. Of course, there's social unrest, peasant revolts, and urban uprisings, and the Hundred Years' War as well. And I'd like for you to watch the short video about Joan of Arc. And um, she was, at this point, she went to um, the king in France and said, I have these visions. St. Michael told me to go to war for France. And... Um, she did. The video outlines that in a really nice way and uh, talks about the sainthood that followed for her. As I mentioned, people are starting to uh, lose confidence in the church. And we have these conflicts that are developing. Um, in terms of conflict with France, Philip IV taxed the church land to raise money for the war, the Hundred Years' War. And he sought to assert authority over the church in France. So during Babylonian captivity in 1309 to 1377, popes lived in Avignon in France, not in Rome. So now we have this uh, problem developing where we have um, a pope in Avignon in France. We also have a pope in Rome, which leads to the Great Schism. I want you to watch the video about the Great Schism here. Um, and then come back and review this part about the 14th century heresies and forward. But um, this would be a great time to watch the video about the Great Schism. The 14th century heresies um, came about from people who spoke out against the church. One heretic was John Wycliffe, who suggested that the Bible of the church was the ultimate authority and passageway for individuals to reach God. So basically, he removed the middleman. He said, you don't have to have church. It's between you and the Bible. And for that reason, Jan Hus is the one who advocated for translation of the Bible into vernacular. Remember, the Bible was largely in you know Greek or Latin. So um, they wanted 
Bible in the local language so the common people could read and understand it, and so they could check things for themselves. If something's written in a language you don't understand, you have to take the word of the interpreter. But if the Bible were translated into the local vernacular, you could know what its meanings were. And this is um, an image that shows French peasants attacking the castle of a lord. Okay. In the later Middle Ages, kings, political theorists, and religious dissenters challenged papal leadership. 14th century thinkers disputed Thomas Aquinas's synthesis of reason and faith and argued that reason contradicted faith. So Thomas Aquinas, remember, back to the video I asked you to watch, is um, the one who said that because God created reason and faith, that the two would never conflict. But William of Ockham said that reason could not prove essential Christian doctrines, and he sought to separate faith from reason and contributed to greater freedom to study nature without having to fit everything into a religious mold. The waning of the Middle Ages opened possibilities for new growth in Western civilization. Institutions born or developed in the Middle Ages included cities, the middle class, universities, and the beginnings of uh, nation states. In the Middle Ages, Europeans became more technological than other major civilizations. Feudalism fostered the idea that law derived from a collaboration of monarchs and subjects. So we've talked about feudalism in the last chapter. Um, the idea that there would be a um, lord of the land, a landlord, and the knights would swear um, fealty to him in order to protect his property and in order to have a place to live. So and then the uh, Lord would give him peasants to serve him and property to stay on in exchange for protection. So that's what we're talking about when we say feudalism. So that shows that there's this collaboration between monarchs and subjects or between lords and um, servants as the knights and servants as peasants. Religion was a fundamental element of medieval life in the same way that science is a fundamental element of modern life. And the modern outlook rejected the medieval perspective of different realms, this hierarchy of God's creation, strict division of people into classes by birth, that sort of thing. Instead, science and secularism determined the modern viewpoint. We have this image here. Um, wisdom urges medieval scholars forward. During the Middle Ages, Europeans made considerable advances in technology. Uh, the astrolabe, the quadrant, sundials, and mechanical clocks shown here exemplify some of these medieval technical skills. And we have here a sculpture of Hermes with young Dionysus another Hellenistic sculpture, a detail from a Pompeian wall fresco, a lady playing the cithara. And here we have this mosaic of Emperor Justinian who ruled Byzantium from 527 to 565. He appears in the middle of this as a Christ symbol rather than as an ordinary ruler. A golden halo and the presence of exactly 12 attendants are reminiscent of the 12 apostles. And in this way, the artist depicts that the human uh, figure, the emperor, was very much related to a religious figure. And this is the enthroned Madonna and child. The faces of the figures, the high back uh, wooden throne, the halos decorated with floral patterns, and the full length image of the Virgin Mary on her throne show an Italian influence in art. This page from a beautifully illustrated volume of prayers, which was made during 1413 through 1416, is one of the paintings of months appearing in the nobleman's book. This is another Madonna with child and saints from about 1445 
and uh, the enthroned Madonna and child are framed by architectural elements and flanked by the formal solemn figures of saints who seem to converse with her or between themselves. And you can see here the elements of the Romanesque architecture, which includes the uh, many arches. And this is an image of the Last Judgment. The major concern of medieval people was salvation of their souls. At the Last Judgment, the good would be drawn into heaven while the damned would be sealed in hell. The Last Judgment is done by the Flemish artist Van Eyck, who depicts this final division in graphic detail. So that wraps us up for Chapter 7. Don't forget to watch the videos of the um, extra segments that I've included in your lecture notes that accompany this material.